Welcome back. It is time for Spotlight. So chances are, if you aren't on a dating app, you probably know at least one person who is. The rise of online dating apps such as Tinder and Bumble has been seen right across the world. Now, our next guest has worked for years to help dating apps and users. Jess Carbino is a relationship and online dating expert who has worked for both Tinder and Bumble as their in-house sociologist. She has since analyzed hundreds of thousands of dating profiles. And we are now joined by Jess Carboneau. Jess was the former sociologist for Tinder and Bumble, and she joins us tonight from Washington, D.C. Jess, good to see you. Thank you, Travis. It's lovely to see you, too. Appreciate you doing this. So I, that's an interesting title, sociologist, uh, former sociologist at Tinder and Bumble. Explain to me what your work included. Well, I was one of the early employees at both Tinder and Bumble, much earlier at Tinder. And my principal role there was to understand how our users were interacting with the app. When I began at Tinder, I was only aware of the number of men and the number of women using the app at a given time. And what was really exciting was that I was able to help build out the entire research infrastructure uh, with my team. And we worked with all of the other teams. It was a really interdisciplinary role where we worked with engineering and product and marketing and communications to be able to understand how our users were navigating the app and how to improve their experience on the app. And then I went on to do the same thing at Bumble when I was there working as a sociologist. So I basically was able to apply my training that I had at UCLA during my doctoral work to a real life dating app. Hmm. And so what did you find? How were people using the, the app and were they finding true love? Was it, you know, love for a minute and a half? Or, or what, what, what were some of your findings? Well, I think what's really interesting is that I began studying online dating in uh -huh. 2009 prior to the emergence of dating apps, uh, there's really what I think about is the two stages of online dating. I think of the pre-app stage, which is basically 1995 to 2012, uh, pre-iPhone essentially, where you have Match, OkCupid, and a variety of other sites that exist where individuals were acting blindly when engaging with other individuals. They were sending out a message, a proffer to another person without knowing whether there was mutual interest necessarily. When Tinder emerged, they democratized the entire process and changed the game because mm. individuals who had historically been acting without knowledge of another person's interest were able to understand really quickly if somebody was also interested in them and were able to move forward in a really meaningful way. Do, do we have any metrics in terms of how successful relationships uh, are when folks do meet on these apps? Well, a lot of the data are relatively nascent. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of data, and there's some data out of Stanford uh, that suggests that individuals who meet online are as likely to be as committed in their relationships, if not slightly more committed than really? their offline counterparts. Yes, and that's for a variety of reasons related to not only the demographic characteristics of people who date online, who tend to and have historically been, although this is changing, um, more highly educated and uh, more affluent, um, and also older, which all predispose people towards relationship stability. Uh, but also data indicate that individuals who are dating online are really motivated. A lot of my own research suggests that individuals who date online are far more likely to commit to a romantic partnership relative to individuals who date offline exclusively. And that's because individuals who date online are able to better visualize and contextualize their experience relative to people who are dating offline where they don't have real time information about how they're faring in the dating market relative to other individuals and can fantasize about the likelihood of meeting somebody and operate in a manner that isn't necessarily consistent with reality. Huh. Uh, yeah, this is a weird question, but are there profiles that do, obviously a picture matters and what you say in your bio matters, but what profiles do better? And or, or do you have any tips on how to create a profile that actually works? Asking for a friend. Absolutely. I, <laughs> asking for a friend, not yeah, yourself. But even if you were asking yeah. for yourself, that would be okay too. Uh, so I think that one of the main things, and I dated online too, so this advice both applied to me personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. When you are dating online, I think the main thing to remember is that your online dating profile should serve to not only signal to people 
who you are and what you're looking for, but also the type of relationship that you're looking for, as well as the types of questions that people can ask you to communicate with you. Because it's really easy to say, oh, wow, this person's really cute or they seem really interesting. But if you don't provide them with enough context to be able to initiate a conversation with you, it's really challenging because the number one thing people want when they're messaging with another individual is that they see that the person messaging them is signaling an investment. And that's really hard if you're not providing any data about yourself. That's really interesting. And I think what's really hard for people to remember and understand when they're creating a profile is that you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar or President of the United States to have something interesting to say about yourself. Uh, you should talk about the experiences that are unique to you and signal the things that make you stand out relative to all of the other individuals within your demographic characteristics and geographic area. As you well know, there's been, you know, criticism of some of these apps. Uh, you know, people say that uh, it's less common to have decency when you're on these apps, less people are respectful, there's more ghosting going on. Do you think that that is a flaw of the online format? Uh, you know, some people say it dehumanizes people, it turns things into a game, swipe right, swipe, swipe left. Well, I think here is the primary issue. Uh -huh. I think that people have not necessarily understood that individuals are bringing themselves with all of their flaws and their defenses and the things that are not necessarily going in the direction of skewing positively in terms of their insecurities when they're entering the dating process. And it is a process. And I think that people often blame the app rather than trying to understand what is going on with an individual at a given time. And I think this is a really interesting example. When I talk to people and I look at data that people have provided, provided to me about ghosting behaviors, you'll see that people will often say, I just don't understand why other people are ghosting me and I find it really frustrating. But then if you ask them, are you ghosting people? Then they will say, oh yes, I ghost people regularly because I don't know how to resolve the fact that I've determined that I'm no longer interested in them. So mm. you have extensive cognitive dissonance going on between individuals in the process of trying to negotiate whether or not they're going to move forward in a relationship. But I would argue, and we see evidence of this if you examine literature, books, television shows, uh, dating back to you know the 19th century, that men and women have long suffered and had confusion in their romantic partnerships, trying to navigate the level of interest they have in another person. So I don't think this is necessarily a new phenomenon at all. Right. I think that individuals just are able to more easily point to a culprit, which is a dating app versus their social connections whom they could blame easily for setting them up with somebody, but are less inclined to do so because there's a higher degree of connective tissue between an individual and a friend who set you up versus a dating app. So there's a, a lot of young people on uh, the team here at Canada tonight. We were having a conversation about this. And, you know, some, some say to me, well, I want to kind of go old school. What do you think the future of these dating apps ahead is? Well, I can certainly understand the impulse to want to date old school. That makes sense to me. Everybody is interested in trying to assert control in their dating lives. And I think the idea of taking control of your life and wanting to meet somebody in person makes sense to me because it's what we have been historically socialized to do. We've been socialized to meet somebody in person. We see it in movies, we see it in TV shows, mm -hmm. we've seen prior generations do it. But again, if you look at the data from Pew Research Center and a variety of other sources, we know online dating is stable and increasingly the number one way individuals meet their romantic partner. And I, I think that's because of broader social demographic changes. And I don't see the age at first marriage and the age at first birth going anywhere. I think that fundamentally these trends will continue. Moreover, we know that for populations, namely the LGBTQ population that has been marginalized historically, the dating apps have served as a really strong and safe place for these individuals to meet romantic partners. And I, I, I only consider, um, the apps as a haven for individuals who are looking to meet romantic partners in a place that's safe. Moreover, I think that these demographic changes are only going to persist. Hmm. Really interesting chat. Jess, appreciate it.
My pleasure. Thank you so much. That was Jess Carboneau. She was the former sociologist for Tinder and also Bumble, joining us from Washington, D.C.